So we have a number of amazing presenters that have presented all day long, and I've saved another amazing presenter up last, but definitely not least, a good friend, longtime artist, presenter, and he shares so much with the community. So thanks again for sharing even more today. Uh, Michael Rosen, ladies and gentlemen, from samplistic.com. Hello? Yes, thank you. Well, my name is Michael Rosen, and I am from uh, Samplistic Media, that's my company. It's a small uh, studio where we do motion graphics and creative post-production. And uh, to get you a little familiar with our work, we do all different styles of things, and I'll just play the reel, and we'll go from there. Thank you, thank you very much. And thank you to uh, Maxon for having me here today. It's an honor. And I'm very excited to share some really cool cinema, cinema 4D stuff for you. Hopefully you can take it home and uh, use it in many different ways. Um, I'm gonna break down a couple projects and I think there'll be lots of little tidbits along the way for you. But before I get into that, I have a little gift. It's an espresso rig that uh, we made, and it's called Simple Moves. And if you're not familiar, I mean, basically, if you're familiar with the camera morph tag, this is kind of like that, but for regular object animation. So if you're not, I'll just explain it a little bit here. Um, you have a, an object that you want to move, and you have nulls in space wherever you'd like them to be. And you have a simple slider that will move your object through the nulls. So this, I got the idea for this basically because I found myself kind of animating with the uh, position uh, constraint tag. Um, sometimes clients need changes in certain ways. Sometimes you're putting together files to iterate in different ways. And, and uh, I found that this was very helpful. So just to explain it a little bit, you have a single curve that controls the speed of your animation. And you don't have to worry about your rotation, all that's contained, or, or your position, all that's contained with the nulls. So you can, you can iterate really fast, like as the thing's moving, you can, you can uh, make changes and sort of play with that. Um, you, can, uh, you can change the curve, sort of like flow in After Effects. Um, yeah. get a nice ease. And, uh, and it's not for everything. I mean, you have all different types of ways of animating in, in cinema. Sometimes you're using splines. Sometimes you're using dynamics. This is just another way. It's called simple moves because it's actually really simple. Sometimes you just need like a product, like a box, to just slide into a certain place and, um, and lock in at exactly that place, and you can do it to a null. Another uh, example uh, is when you have your focus of your camera. So uh, here I have a little scene, and it's in redshift here. I have um, the camera with a focus object on it. I got these three animals out there. 
and an animation that is set up so that it, it focuses on the stegosaurus, and then we move the animation, then moves, and it focuses on the horse, and then it focuses on the elephant. And this just animates to specific points that I've put uh, knolls on on those, uh, on those uh, objects, so on the elephant's eye, on the stegosaurus. And then what happens is, is that somebody comes and asks you to change the animation or change you know, position of something, and you have your timing for your rack focus all set out, and this can help you with just keeping that exactly the same. So no matter where that stegosaurus moves, it's going to, um, it's going to focus on the stegosaurus, then the horse, and then the elephant. So <laughs> let's see if it's doing it. Sometimes a, a redshift needs a little update. There we go. So this all started um, when I was doing a project that uh, had a map. And we had to have this uh, stack of money pop in from the bank to the map, to another place on the map, to another place on the map. And we knew the timing. We had the voiceover, but we didn't, uh, we didn't know exactly where in the country the money had to go. So this was just a way that this is a way that we could sort of um, get all of the animation kind of locked in. Maybe you're making a template. Maybe you have to make a hundred of these, and they all have to have different sort of placements. And you can get you can have the animation uh, already created, the timing already created, the curves of your your sort of ease in and everything already created. Yet you can still move it around really really easily. So I'll just show you how this works. Um, we have your simple moves null, and you just drag what you want. This, in this case, the money stack goes into there. And then you have your slider up here, and you have these different targets. So I'm just going to drag these nulls. I have the first null, second, third. Let's just drag them in there. And then you can just animate your slider. So I'll go from 0 to 100 will get us to the first null. And then 200 will get us to the next null. So that's something that I really liked. Like I found that with the camera morph tool, I never really know exact, you know, sure if you have four nulls, 25% means you're on one of them. But this is really easy to know exactly which null you're on because you have 100%, uh, 200%, 300%. That's first null, second null, third null. And so this just, if I duplicate these, null, these uh, keyframes here, they will, sorry, so Windows thing, there we go. Interesting. Make it go faster. So we have our animation there, and then if you want to change that, you can grab a null and move it and your animation changes. So I'm really excited to see what you guys do with it. It's free. Go to my website, go to samplistic.com, and I'll put this up at the end again. But you can also reach me at uh, Samplistic Media on Twitter. So let's move on. Let's go to some projects. Um, first one I want to talk about is a feature documentary we did all the animations for. And it's called Why Not Home. It was a documentary on um, home birth examining all the sides, and we needed an organic, homemade, kind of uh, friendly style. So it was this, uh, this watercolor look. And, uh, and, you know, there was a lot of data, and there was a lot of sort of time constraints as far as production. So we knew we needed a style that could be alive, even though it was just sort of sitting there. And, um, and this is what we came up with. Um, I really liked the style, but at the time when I was doing it, there was not the takes system. There was not, there was Cineware, but it didn't, it didn't have the take system integrated into it. And as far as I know, I've never heard of anybody, uh, anybody talking about the fact that the take system can actually pipe into Cineware. So that blew my mind because this is a, this is a, a process to, to get this kind of rough around the edges, organic look. It's a process of outputting a few different 
passes from Cinema 4D into After Effects, and then doing some stuff in After Effects. And when I did this project, it was making the animation, making different Cinema 4D files to render out the different looks, rendering them, bringing them in After Effects, doing the post-processing, and if there was a change, then doing all that again. So I have figured out this, this workflow that Maxon has given us, and you guys have to know about it. It's crazy. So let me first show you how this, generally how this process works for this watercolor uh, effect. You start with three different looks. You have the lines, you have the color, and you have the shaded pass. Get these out of cinema, bring them into After Effects, blur them, distort them, use blend modes to mix them together, and then uh, put some paper texture into it, some time uh, posterization effects, and you get your final look. So I'm going to open up cinema and show you how this works. OK. So here we have just a scene that I have uh, with the baby, the mom in a knoll. There's a little animation on them. And it's very simple geometry. This is one thing that I really liked about this. Is like, it's like very, very simple. And I have a light and a camera. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up the, the materials and the looks and, the, and create takes and then get that over to After Effects. So the first thing I'm going to do is um, well, I'll put on the interactive region so we can see what we're getting a little bit. And I'll make a default material, put it on the baby, put it on the mom, copy it to the mom. And essentially, that's our first look, just shaded with a light, nothing really, just black and, black and white. And um, let's hold, just that's one thing. We'll get that uh, going in a second into takes. I'm going to make a new or copy that, that material. And uh, over here, I'm just going to turn off everything on this new material except for luminance. And under luminance, I'm going to pick a color like a baby blue and put that on the baby. On top of or to the right of the shaded texture. And that's the way cinema works is that it uses the material that's furthest to the right first if it can and then it looks further down if it, if it can or needs to. So then I'll just duplicate that material, and I'll put it on the mom again on the outside. And for that, I'll change the color to like a pink. Oops, I'm on color, and it should be on luminance. So luminance just gives us that just straight color, nothing else, no shading. OK, so we have the mom and the baby and the color pass. And um, let's start to set up the takes, because this is, this is that simple. So over here, we have the takes manager. What takes are is essentially a way to assign a whole array of settings, whatever you want, essentially throughout the whole program of cinema, and say, when I change, change all this stuff for me. When I switch between takes, change this stuff. So I'm going to make a new take here. And this is our look, which is called it's called color, we'll name it color. And, and then what you need to do is sort of give the take system the things that you want it to pay attention to. You can do it, autom there's a way to do it automatically. I like to be a little more in control and just drag these things down there. I'm dragging the material tags in and I'm saying basically when I change takes, look at those things, right? So cinema's now kind of following me along here. And I'm going to duplicate this take by holding Control down. And I'm going to call this one Shaded. And I'm going to go onto the Shaded one. And essentially, the change that I want to make between the color and the Shaded is I want to disable the color out here. And there's no real way to like disable. There's no Disable button. But if you give it a selection, here in the material tag, it's going to look for any polygons that have that selection. And since no polygons have a selection at all, I can put anything I want in here, and it will disable the tags on the outside. So now it's looking down and seeing the shaded version. And if I switch between shaded to color, 
you can see what's, what Takes is doing for us. And then we have uh, the final look, which is the lines. And that's done with Sketch and Tune. It's, it takes a uh, change in the render settings as well. So uh, what I'm going to do is go open the render settings. We're just in standard render, and it has this render setting here called My Render Settings. And I'm going to duplicate that. I'm going to go into that. I'm going to call this S and T for Sketch and Tune. And the difference is going to be that I'm going to launch Sketch and Tune from the effect menu there. So you can see what it does to our, our render already. Um, but I don't want that uh, shaded thing. I just want the lines. So under this shaded tab here, I'm going to go down to objects. And instead of shading, I'm going to select uh, custom color. So it's just white. And I'll close that just so you know what it did is it when I when I launched it, it made a material here that's sort of default on everything in Sketch and Tune. It's a sketch material. And if I go back to my takes manager over here and I duplicate this take, I'm gonna call this S and T as well. And I go to it, it's not doing it yet. Because over here, you can select your render settings that you want to be on each take. So I'm just going to, it's by default, it's inherent from parent. I'm going to specify just to be really specific. Sketch and tune for that one. For the shaded one, I just want to use my render settings. Same thing for the, the color. So now, as I change these, we have our three takes. And now I'm going to use Cineware. So what I need to do is uh, save this file. So I'll go NAB. And now I've just saved the Cinema 4D file. And if you're not aware of what Cineware is, Cineware is a link, direct link without rendering between Cinema and After Effects. So you know, in the past, you would have had to have render out a sequence and then bring that in as footage. Now you can just import the Cinema 4D file right into After Effects. OK. Let's see. So trying to introduce a little bit of that, that basic stuff, I'm sure a lot of you know that. And as you see this uh, sort of connection start to work, it's going to get cooler and cooler. Uh, it's kind of, kind of a little mind boggling. We have to do a little setup. And then once you do the setup, that's it. You just do it one time. And then you've got this pipeline that you've essentially built for your whole project. So I have the Cinema 4D file here. And I need to pre-comp it into three different pre-comps, basically. So I'm going to drag it into a comp. Um, one thing you should be aware of also is, is when you're using uh, Cineware, you have this options tag, this options uh, thing here. And you, just want, you can select the version of Cinema. By default, I believe it's Lite, which comes with After Effects. But uh, we already have this selected. We selected R20, the studio version. So I'm going to hit Cancel. Just wanted to let you know about that. Um, and it's by default showing us our, our, uh, our Cinema 4D file. And there it is. It's a viewport view by default. I'm going to change that. So I'm going to go to the settings in Cineware and change it from software to final. And if you look right here, there's a big button that says set take. And it's already set to shaded. But we can see that we have our other takes right there. And I'm just going to say, OK, that's fine. I'm going to uh, rename this pre-comp shaded. And I'm going to duplicate it. And I'm going to call this one color. And I'm going to select, go into that one, select the file, and set that take to color. Should change. Yeah. And again, I'll duplicate it. I'll call this one S and T. Go in there, do the same thing. All right, Let's see if it works. Yes. OK. Again, no rendering. This is all a live connection. Um, 
and I can drag all of these into a new composition so that they become my, my footage. Great. So now I can, now I can combine them. We should get the, this is the sketch and tune. I'll put it on top. Get the lines on top. Now they're, it's all white. So I can now use blend modes in 2D on my 3D stuff that is still live coming from Cinema 4D. So I'm going to put the, the uh, sketch and tune lines on multiply. So we just get the black lines. And we're seeing through to the color. Um, put the color on the bottom. I'll put the shaded on an overlay mode so that it kind of shades and adjust the brightness and darkness and saturation of the color below it. And uh, I'm going to put the, the color on, on multiply because I have a, a, a paper texture that I, that I made. I'm going to bring that in. It's, it's uh, just a, a paper texture with some wiggle on it. So it's just a different paper texture every frame. That's all, that's all that it is. But because the color is on multiply, it's going to bleed through a little bit. OK, so if you're not, so there, there it goes into the background. There it is. Maybe I'll make it a little smaller, scale it down. So again, if you don't, if you don't know what, what uh, Cineware really is doing, is this live pipeline is, is live. So if I go back to cinema and make a change, we're going to see that immediately reflected in our animation here. So one thing that um, I forgot to do is make the lines animated and wiggly and kind of distorted and human there in Sketch and Tune. So I'm going to go back into cinema, and I'm going to go to my main take here. And I'm just going to select that sketch material, turn on the distort strokes. And uh, the curve stroke here, I'm going to give it a little animation and just save that file and go back into There we go. Get that update. So you see the power of the live connection here. So to comp to create this uh, sort of watercolor rough around the edges thing, this is all very computery, perfect and stuff really low poly models and stuff. I'll show you what I do in After Effects. So I'm going to just go down to the color pass here, and I'm going to run it through some, some effects. So a blur effect. Get that blurred up. Uh, let's do a turbulence displace. Uh, where is it? Distort. Turbulence displace. And just that's going to kind of ripple it and kind of make it wobbly and moving. And the whole goal here is like imperfection, because computers make everything so perfect. And we want this to be artistic and kind of homemade. So that's, that's pretty rough right there. Oh, and it's playing while I'm adjusting that. That's going to slow things down. OK, so that, that's a, a, a distort there with the turbulence displace. And this evolution, if we keep it moving, it will keep it wobbling around. So I'm going to put a, uh, you could animate that, but I'm going to put a uh, uh, After Effects um, expression on there, time, times 800, or times something. We'll just keep that moving. And there we, you can sort of see what that's doing. And the paper texture is just moving. So we get that, that kind of a look going there. And I'm going to, I'm going to duplicate that uh, turbulence displace. And I'm going to make another one that's uh, a lot smaller to get more distortion going on here. Just the amount. And for this one, I'm going to go into the evolution options and change the random seed so it's just a different noise that's distorting it here. And I'm going to take all of this and copy it. And then turn on the shaded version. And I'm going to put the same thing onto that. But I'm going, to, I'm going to go into both of the turbulent displaces on the shaded version and change the random seed here so that they're different, too. So we're getting all of this variance 
from After Effects on this really, really simple, easy to output stuff. So now the, the shading is changing every frame in this sort of imperfect, wobbly, screwed up way. And then you got the color changing in, in every frame. And uh, we add, and our lines are changing every frame coming from cinema. Maybe I can like lower the opacity of that, of those black lines, so they're a little more uh, homemade. And uh, another little comping trick here is uh, to take, I'm going to duplicate that paper texture and put it on top. And I'm going to put that on screen mode. So this sort of gets the highlights and the, rough, the roughness of the paper on top of You barely see it there. So I, I want to uh, just chop, chop off a lot of that. I'll use a uh, levels adjustment and just chop, chop off a lot of the blacks in the image. So if I turn off the screen mode, what that really is is just those, those, just those little bits of white make it even more. And I'll put that back on screen mode so you can see how that really starts to feel like it's integrated into the paper. And it feels like the watercolor is bleeding out in different ways every frame. The idea is it's kind of like stop motion, right? Like it's every frame is different. You could wiggle. You could put a wiggle on each of those passes if you wanted to. I mean, I'm really just, this is the, I mean, I can't even think how, how many different things you can do with this process. It really blew my mind. I wish I had it when I did the project. Um, but uh, let me add one more thing, and then I'll, I'll let it render. Um, a uh, adjustment layer and a posterized time effect. So that's going to just reduce the time, uh, the, f the frames per second, down to, say, 12. And uh, let's see here. Yeah, there it goes. Let it render a few. Th and what we'll see is we'll see her turn around, right? So this is the power of using the 3D stuff to get, to get a lot of drawings that you can't, I couldn't draw it, you know? So, but you get to use, you know, camera moves around 3D objects, 3D objects just rotating, and you get this, this amazing sort of hand done kind of effect. I can imagine oil painting stuff, I can imagine. And by the way, I believe you can, you can access your third-party renders through here as well, because in those uh, Cineware options, you're accessing your core um, studio version of Cinema 4D. So if you have, say, Redshift installed, and maybe you're making all different types of passes in Redshift with like custom AOVs and that sort of thing, now your custom AOVs could be takes, and the takes, or your layers could be takes, Cinema 4D layers can be takes, by the way, or controlled by takes. So you can have different layers coming through. And uh, let's see how this looks. Mm -hmm. Yay. Kind of cool. I'm stoked about that. Like, I'm. And I've never heard of anybody talking about this. So I thought, I really, you know, I'm really excited about everybody getting to take this to your own level, to your own kind of projects, your own styles. Um, but let's, let me just show you, like, we just did all that work so we can do this. Now that it's, we have that live pipeline. So I'm going to bring a Taurus into here and... Uh, Bring this uh maybe uh yeah. animate this thing. Let's see. Boop. So there, maybe some rotation, just so that it moves, get some dimension. Yeah. And I'll just copy these tags onto that. Make sure, see I don't know why I put that on the inside. I'm gonna put that on the outside because that's how we set it up. I'm just going to hit save. Let's see what happens if I go back into After Effects. Ah, new illustration. I love that. I love when you can like set something up to just do stuff for you. 
and you can, you know, like Sketch and Tune, you can get all these crazy lines. I just used like really basic, the default lines, but you can do, you know, set up thickness and colors and distortions and cloning of the lines, and it's all in there, and it'll all come through here. So. Oh, and you know, you may notice also that this is this is kind of rendering kind of slow. For, uh, for, for After Effects, that's because it's literally taking our one animation, it's rendering three different renders, and it's doing all of the uh, displacement and all of this comping. It's doing all of that in After Effects. And you can render out this way, and I probably would. I'd probably leave it live for the client in this situation. So that way, if they want to change, I just open up the Cinema 4D file, make that change. It'll reflect through, and... Um, and then I'll just render out of After Effects for that. But if you wanted to get that going real fast, now that you've like developed this look, all you have to do with the take system is you can press this button right here, render all takes to picture viewer. So then you just render it off once. Then anytime you're doing any iterations in After Effects, you, you, can, uh, you just replace those, replace those files in the pre-comp with the actual rendered version. It'll be like much faster. Cool. Okay, so that's one project. And the next project is a beer commercial. So this is a company called Lagunitas. They have a beer with sake in it. And, on, and I actually just saw in Vegas here, we were driving on the freeway, and they have it painted on a building. There's this little guy on the, on the label, and he's punching the, the T in the title. It's called Sock It To Me. So it's like he's socking it. It's got sake in it. They're a brand that likes to play. And um, they called me up and said, hey, we've got this idea. What if the little guy jumps down and punches the bottle? And here it is. And this was rendered in Redshift. And it was actually the first thing we did in Redshift. So it was sort of a learning process. Very, very fun. Very cool to work in Redshift. And um, it's got a lot of elements. So I'll just play it one more time. He jumps down. He gets on the bottle. He ends up on the, the bottle, how the label really is. And um, I'm going to get into cinema and uh, show you a bunch of aspects of how to make this. Basic to some of the like, hacks and workarounds that I, that I came up with, because it was a fast thing. So here we go. I'm going to, uh, I've got my little redshift viewer here. Um, maybe I'll, that's fine. Let's see. I'm going to make a, a table. That done. There's a plane. We can see it reflecting right, right now in, in redshift over there. I'll turn that off at, at certain times. Um, but I might as well do the other stuff like, you know, since we're talking about redshift and Maxon acquiring redshift and stuff today. Um, and some other stuff, like how about a Grayscale Gorilla plug, plug-in, HDRI link. If you drag your dome map into HDRI link, then now it's connected, and you can launch the Grayscale Gorilla browser and pick something just to light your scene with. So I'm just going to pick something that's kind of outdoors, maybe this one. And that starts to light our scene here. And I just wanted to have that there, maybe a camera, put a redshift tag on the camera so that we're kind of we're kind of going. I'm going to pop in and render and then not render at certain times here. Uh, there we go. OK, so um, I'm going to build a bottle. And I'm going to look at the front view here. And let's see, I don't have my axis. I want to do it right in the center. Uh, world axis, yeah. So I want to, uh, if you don't know, there's something called a lathe tool, which means that you basically draw like half the bottle and then it spins it around and makes it into a thing. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to draw kind of the profile of a bottle here on the table. And maybe it's like that. Sure. Do a little, and I'm sort of making the... Uh, making like the thickness of the bottle here. This is pretty bad. Okay. Um, 
these two points down here, there's another thing I don't really hear people talking about, but I want to I wanna make sure that they're right on the center axis. And there is a way to do that in Cinema. You can highlight those things. And it's called the Structure Manager. And if you open the Structure Manager, I have it here. You want to make sure that just your, your points and object is selected. And now you have all your like, data about the spline points. You can see the two, that are, the two that are selected are the two that I have selected. So I'm just going to double click in there and hit 0 on the x-axis just to make those things on the x-axis. Um, OK, cool. Let's go to the 3D view here. And uh, we're going to make a lathe object. And in the object manager, you just drag that spline into the lathe object, and boom, you have a bottle. Oh, I never turned off the Redshift renderer over there, so it's going. Um, also, I'll show you some really basic stuff in Redshift here. So um, as we go, that could kind of be kind of fun. So, uh, create a uh, Redshift material. Material. Now I've got a Redshift material. And I've got a shader view over here that I like to use. But you can double click and also click the Edit Shader Graph. And uh, Redshift comes with some just really basic uh, presets. So I'm just going to select the material node here and select the preset thing and uh, get some tinted glass. And I'll drag that onto the bottle. And uh, yeah, it's kind of tinted a little bit. Depends on the size of the bottle, how much it's tinted. But you can go and control that down here in your uh, reflection, transmission, subsurface. See, it's sort of tinted red. If you do this number up a little bit, like if I go to 0.03, you can see it gets sort of thicker. And if I change the color, I'll change it to like a brown, kind of like we had in the spot. Could make it thicker. But um, kind of into it being sort of see-through here. So there's our, there's our glass bottle lit by a dome map in Redshift. And I'm going to turn off the, the render for a second here. Because the next thing I want to do is make it rock. I want to animate that rock so like the little character jumps on and knocks it. Uh, I could render, I could, I could animate that with curves and stuff. but. Um, I want to do a dynamic simulation. So I've got this bottle here. I'm going to just duplicate this setup here with the lathe because I'm going to use that a little bit later. And I'm going to select this bottle and make it just an editable mesh. Maybe we can see like that there. And uh, I'm going to put a simulation tag onto it. Rigid body tag from the, I right click and I'm going to rename this bottle. OK, and the plane, the table, make that a, put a simulation collider body on that so that it doesn't fall through the ground. And to knock it, I'll make a sphere, make it real small. And I'll kind of, uh, I'll put a collider body on that too, copy it from the plane. And I'm just going to animate this thing to kind of like knock into that and oh it's already starting to do something okay so that's 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 how you can set up dynamic simulations and uh, we've got it hitting it but it's kind of making it slide so I'm just going to go on these tags and turn up the uh, the friction so it doesn't really slide on the ground as much oh that's cool so, I, so to art direct this sort of thing, you might, you might make the, the, the ball go faster. I really, that's kind of what I was going for. <laughs> but uh, here we go. Let's make it go a little faster. Ah, it knocks it over too much. So this is kind of how you start to play when you're doing simulations. You start to play, you know. And um, essentially, I'm good with it if it doesn't knock over. I want a big knock, but I don't want it to, like, fall over. So that's exactly what I want. So I'm just going to... Uh, bake this now into an animation. Really easy. Just uh, go to the beginning, your timeline. I'm going to make a keyframe there for the bottle. Um, and it shows up on my timeline. And I select it and go to functions, bake objects. The default works good. And it just does that. It duplicates it. And I've got all these keyframes here. 
Okay, I'm going to delete that sphere and the and the uh, the dynamic bottle, and let's just look at this for a second. Uh, curves. So all this animation is now done for us, and if I hit play, we've got that going on, and I can go backwards and forwards, and it's baked in. Cool. Now let's uh, let's put some water into it. Water or beer? Beer. Okay. Um, let's. I put this lathe aside. Remember, the lathe is the exact inside and outside of the glass. So now I just want to use the inside. So I'm gonna. I'm gonna turn off this bottle actually for a second. I'll hold. Windows. Uh, I'll hold Alt down. Turn it off, and let's look at this lathe again. Turn the spline on. Turn the lathe off so I can just see the spline. I'm gonna go back to the front view. And I need to alter this so that it's no longer just this piece of glass around the edges. It's the inside. It's the water. It's the beer. So uh, I'm going to select these outside points. And that's good. Delete them. And maybe bring this to the center. I just like to do this. I'm not even sure if you have to, but I'd like to zero that out. And uh, let that lay the round. Now that's kind of like an inside chunk inside the bottle. It's actually right along the edge of the glass. So maybe I'll select that, that, those spline points again. And I'll just select them all and kind of just reduce them down just a teeny bit so they're not exactly taking up the exact same space as the inside of the bottle. And uh, now I've got this chunk. Let's duplicate this redshift material. Go in, uh, maybe I'll rename it for the sake of I'll call it uh, beer. And I'm just going to replace the material on that lathe and go into the settings of this thing. I'll make it a little thinner and maybe more yellow, orange, brighter kind of color. It's a start. So right now, if I go and look at it in 3D view, uh, kind of looks like that. It's not really very beer looking but let's turn on the let's turn on the uh you know what let's go to this water eh, it looks more like water maybe we could tint that but uh let's turn on the 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 bottle now again and um it wraps around it and it's kind of filled to the brim maybe i can turn that back to beer yeah, who cares? Let's keep going. You'll get the uh, you get the idea. Thing is, though, is that like oh, and if I just make that a child of the bottle, right at the very beginning, because that's where I had everything like zeroed out and the bottle hadn't moved yet. Now we have that water inside there, and you can barely tell really because it's filling the whole thing. So we want to chop off the top, and we actually want it to kind of slosh a little bit. And this was sort of a, um, a hack, a sort of workaround, because a lot of people would think, well, let's do a fluid simulation, and that can take some time. Uh, I'll show you my little hack that I came up with. It's kind of fun, and it actually became way easier now that we have these cool um, R20 features, like the volume uh, measure and builder. So I'm going to get a volume builder and a volume measure and put the builder in the measure. And this is a way I did it with a bool, actually, when I was uh, doing it. Uh, in, in reality, but uh, this is so much better. So uh, back at the very beginning of my timeline, I'm going to drop that as a child under the uh, bottle, and I'm going to put the lathe inside that, and, ascend, and I'm going to turn off the, the bottle, and I'm going to turn on the view of that stuff in there, and uh, I'll put the water texture on the actual volume measure, and you can see it's making this really low poly mesh here. And you can control that by what your voxel size is in your volume builder. It's essentially taking this chunk that is the lathe and making a whole new chunk out of it that's voxelized. So you can see I'm controlling that, that, that resolution just by controlling the size of the voxels. And, and that's, that's good for this for right now. Now I want to subtract the top, right? So I'm going to make a cylinder and reduce the height and bring that up. It's pretty big. Bring it down. OK. 
kind of somewhere right in there. And if I drop that into the volume builder, we can subtract it. But before I do that, it's a little easier to see it, uh, see what I'm about to do this way. I want to do another dynamic simulation, but this is not a fluid simulation. This is not a soft body simulation. It's just regular rigid body dynamics. Um, but we're going to use a connector. So if I duplicate that cylinder above it, and I just bring that up a little bit, and we can make we can copy the collider t the collision tag to the top one, and to the bottom one. I will add a uh, rigid body simulation tag. And in the simulate menu up here, I'm going to pick a dynamics connector. I like to kind of put them between the two of them, because that's how I think about it. But I'm going to just actually put them between the two of them here. Raise that up a little bit. And this connector has a bunch of different options. Its default is hinge, but I'm going to turn it to ball and socket. And I'm going to drop the top object in object A and the bottom object in object B. And now let's drop that whole thing under the bottle and uh, turn the view back on for that. And let's see what happens when we, when we, I'm going to turn off the render here for a second. So you see it's, it's now it's, it's sort of, it's, wobbling around, right? And this is going to, we're going to use this to drive how we cut off the top of the fluid. So, but it's wobbling too much. And in the connector, there's this thing called ignore collisions, and it's checked by default. And if you uncheck it, it now kind of rotates around and hits that top thing. That's why I put that there, because it, it's, I think it makes the, the sort of fluid surface at the top look a little better. OK, so all we have to do now is just drag. Drag, really, I can turn off the visibility of the top one and drag the bottom one into the, the volume builder. And it adds it to the fluid. Let's see what that looks like just for fun. Uh, lots of fluid. OK, and then and look at that. It's like going while, while it's playing, while it's doing a dynamic simulation. OK, I'm going to stop that so it, it goes faster. and. Uh, and I'm going to go to the volume builder. And here we can see our objects in the volume builder, the cylinder and the lathe. And it's set to union on the cylinder. If I set it to subtract, now let's look at it again. And hopefully we can zoom in there and see that we have a, a surface to the fluid. Let's see. I'll turn off the bottle just to, to show you that a little better. And it, there, there's the surface chopped off. But we don't have really good resolution. Thing is, it's all live. So I'm just going to reduce this down. Maybe it's got a 2. See, the resolution's getting better, 1.5. And uh, let's turn the bottle back on right now. And oops, I did something crazy there. I hit Control, and it, and it, it turned off all the objects. OK. All right, so we are rendering. Let's see what the, the, what the angle looks like. Once it angles, we should fluid would be at an angle, right? So you sort of see it sloshing around there. Oop, I missed it. Pause it there. Uh, let's get a good view of this thing. Let's turn off the bottle again. Turn on the mesher. See our surface now. So you can see that surface is, is, is angling and sort of sloshing around. You could take this further. The idea was is that you, know, you don't really see this, because we're going to get into the next thing we're going to do is we're going to put all the frost and the, the water beads and stuff on, on the uh, bottle. And uh, you don't really see it, but again, if it wasn't there, it might not feel quite right. So I wanted, I wanted that, that fluid there at the top. Um, another thing that you could do once you do this is you could just highlight this whole thing and bake it down with a Lembic. Maybe this would look better at like 0.8 or something. There you go. And also, again, it's still live, so I can uh, maybe I lower the, the, vol the, the level of that water so we see that, that simulation a little, little clearer now. There you go. 
cool, right? <laughs> All right, so, so that's, that's the hack. That is, that's like the, the had to figure something out. And again, you can have a, now you can use fields, you can use whatever for that surface, and you can generate bubbles or, or a, you know, uh, like a frost or froth. Um, and, uh, and so let's move on. Let's tur turn this bottle back on. And let's get some beads of, of fluid there. I'm going to just use a, a cloner and a platonic. And put the platonic in the cloner. Turn off this renderer for a second. That's big. I'm going to drop these things down to like two. And oh, we can still see that thing at the top there. OK. So this cloner has an object setting. And you can put the bottle in there so that it knows to clone them on the bottle. And you can turn up the amount. So we start to get these little platonics all over the bottle. And they look, let's see what it looks like in the render. Ah, doesn't quite look right. Um, let's put the beer texture on them. OK, starting to be really wet. and. But they're still really hard. So again, at the time when I was doing this, uh, the R20 did not exist. But now, this is really cool. I used the uh, Metaballs thing, which was way slower. Now we got the Volume Builder. Let's throw it in the Volume Builder again. It's so cool. Um, OK, so immediately it's a big chunk. But again, if you drop this down, we're going to start to see a, like a wetness effect coming. I'm going to put that fluid on there. We're just going to keep dropping the, the, the vol voxel size. Uh -oh, OK, don't go too crazy. Uh, OK, so we'll leave it like that, and then we'll make this uh, smaller beads, and maybe even more of them. And what that, what that volume builder is doing, maybe we go up a little bit more, because we want to see a uh, kind of clumping things together like like water droplets. So that's cool. And by the way, I mean I just threw that on. So it's actually cloning those bubbles on the inside too. We can make a selection to say where we want those things, but um, there's another side to this effect that really, really helps. And this gets back into some redshift uh, very simply. So the way redshift works is you have an output for your surface in in your you edit it with nodes. And you have an output to the surface from a material node. And then you can pipe all different types of stuff into that material node, just like you're kind of used to with any other material system, any other renderer. Um, so I'm going to get a texture node here. Can I grab that? Yes. And I'm going to pipe that into, you get all these options, the reflection roughness. and. Um, you can also access Cinema 4D shaders in Redshift already, even though um, see that's not even though they just bought them. Uh, <laughs> it's been there for a little while. C4D shader node, and I can just pipe that into my texture. And I like it because I, I Cinema 4D has all these great noises, and I like to use them. So, but in this case. Uh, I just created a, a noise shader. The noise shader is piping in the rough, roughness. And you can see some parts are starting to get really rough. And that's due to the noise that we're putting on there. But I'm going to make it uh, smaller. Let's go down to like 8 or so. And let's increase the, the contrast. So we get some really shiny parts and then some really frosty parts. And I found that like when you, when you kind of see that, in combination with these, these bubbles, these, these water droplets, you start to get that effect of like a frosty, wet bottle. And then maybe you make like a little bit of a, a, a thing on the floor that's just like a really slim w piece of water so that it, it's sitting in its own puddle a little bit, like it's in the sun. Um, we could keep going and we could keep going. Let me. Sh let me uh, that, that's what I aimed to do, everybody. Um, I'll probably, I'll probably uh, continue a little bit here. But let me show you 
uh, just a behind the scenes of the making of this project for some of the other stuff here. So there we are. This is similar stuff, right? Showing we didn't do the bottle cap. Again, we could probably do that with the volume builder too, with a cloner for all the edges and stuff. Um, using bump maps in Redshift to do the glass, logo on the glass. The 2D was done in 2D and then put on a card in front of the bottle so that when the camera moved, it would be there. The lighting is really incredible in Redshift. I don't know if you guys knew, but you can render out your lighting as separate passes. Uh, Redshift has all these great ways of getting all these passes out for compositing and control. And this is the final piece. Thank you very much. My name is Michael Rosen. And here's my information. Again, go to the website if you want to get that uh, espresso rig. And uh, I appreciate it all. Thanks for watching. Yeah, yeah.